let us continue with the essay old china written by charles lamb so i am going to read the next paragraph you are too proud to see a play anywhere now but in the pit do you remember where it was we used to sit when we saw the battle of hexham and the surrender of calais and banister and mrs bland in the children in the wood when we squeezed out our shillings a piece to sit three or four times in a season in the one shilling gallery where you felt all the time you ought not to have brought me and more strongly i felt obligation to you for having brought me and the pleasure was the better for a little shame when the curtain drew up what cared we for our place in the house or what mattered it where we were sitting when our thoughts were with rosalind in arden or with viola in the court of illyria so uh, now she goes on to yet another she here you know is bridget she goes on to yet another anecdote a happy memory from the past she says that when they were uh, poorer they used to uh, go and they used when they went for a play they had to sit in the pit okay so she uh, says that when they were poorer they uh, would could not afford to sit in the pit now pit is a place where uh, the the wealthier people sit okay and so she says you now will sit only in the pit to watch a play but earlier that was not the case we had to sit along with the poor people because we ourselves were poor and then she asks him do you remember where it was we used to sit when we saw she mentions the name of a few plays like battle of exam surrender of kelly and then uh, she talks about banister and mrs bland these are popular actors who acted in the play children in the wood and then uh, those days one a seat the fare for one seat was one shilling a piece and so they had to sit in the one shilling gallery which used to be overcrowded with a lot of people and they had to push in they had to uh, jostle through the crowd and elbow through the crowd to find a seat and each time they went there uh, elia used to feel that it is not safe for a lady and so he shouldn't have brought bridget but each time bridget thought uh, she was very grateful she felt obliged to him Uh, for having brought because she enjoyed she thoroughly enjoyed the experience of watching the play and then she says uh, they did feel a little shameful having to fight for their seats and having to push and pull but once the curtain went up they forgot all these difficulties and then we did not care for where we sat we did not care for the place in the house whether we are uh, sitting in the pit or whether we are sitting uh, in the one shilling gallery did not matter at all and it did not matter uh, where we were sitting and the only thing that mattered is that they enjoyed the play and so their thoughts were fully with rosalind in arden uh, that is a reference to the play as you like it written by shakespeare and viola in the court of illyria that again viola is a character in 12th night of shakespeare so she says that uh, no matter what difficulty they faced in procuring a seat in the one shilling gallery uh, once the curtain went up they forgot all that difficulty and they were immersed in the play they thoroughly enjoyed the play no matter where they were sitting you used to say that the gallery was the best place for all of all for enjoying a play socially that the relish of such exhibitions must be in proportion to the infrequency of going that the company we met there not being in general readers of the place were obliged to attend the more and did attend to what was going on on the stage because the word lost would have been a chasm which it was impossible for them to fill up with such reflections we consoled our pride then and i appeal to you whether as a woman i met generally with less attention and accommodation than i have done since in more expensive situations in the house the getting in indeed and the crowding up those inconvenient staircases was bad enough but there was still a law of civility to women recognized to quite as great an extent as we ever found in the other passages 
and how a little difficulty overcome heightened the snug seat and the play afterwards. Now we can only pay our money and walk in. You cannot see, you say, in the galleries now. I am sure we saw and heard too well enough then. But sight and all, I think, is gone with our poverty. So uh, she continues uh, to recount this theatre experience and she says, those days you used to say that the gallery was the best place to watch a play. Now, uh, in Shakespeare's times, the pit was the place where uh, uh, the groundlings used to sit. They had to sit on the floor and watch. They had to directly look up at the stage like that. But I guess later on, by the time of uh, Charles Lamb, the structure of the theatre had changed and all the best seats, the expensive seats were in the pit or in the centre where they could sit comfortably and watch the play and uh, the one shilling gallery was the was in the they had to go up the stairs and they had to crowd around in the galleries from there they often did not get a good view of the play but because they didn't have money then they had to sit in the gallery one shilling gallery and she says now once since we are wealthy you say that you will sit only in the pit but those days you had 101 reasons to choose the gallery you used to say that the gallery is the best place to enjoy a play socially and uh, the relish of such exhibitions so what he means there is the lesser we go the more we enjoy if you go for all the plays you cannot enjoy so once in a while you should go so that again is an excuse because they did not have money to go for all the plays so this was an excuse he used to say that if we f go frequently we will lose the pleasure of watching uh, the drama so the lesser we go the more we'll enjoy when we go and then uh, she and she used to, he also used to say that the people who sit in the one shilling galleries are not regular readers of the play because they are uneducated masses most of them so they don't read the play so they attend or they are more careful they listen carefully to every word that is said on the stage because even if they miss one word they will not understand what is going on so that is why these are all the reasons that Elia used to give uh, for sitting in the gallery and the main reason is that they did not have the money and he used to justify saying that this is the best place to sit only if we sit here we can enjoy the play to the maximum because all the people here they would listen very carefully and she says yes that was true and I really enjoyed sitting there she says and uh, as a woman uh, now that what she means is that uh, Elia considered the gallery a little unsafe for women because they would be pushed then maybe somebody would uh, uh, touch them or uh, um, all that can happen in a crowd but then she says that that can happen anywhere even in uh, other places as a woman I have received uh, enough attention that is she says that I did not find it more difficult any more difficult in the one shilling gallery than I have found in other places everywhere a woman is treated almost alike and then she says the only difficulty was climbing up the staircase narrow staircases inconvenient staircases but once we sit down once they get a seat a snug seat how enjoyable it used to be and she says now what is the case you have money so we can simply buy a ticket just walk in you don't have to climb the staircase you can just easily walk in and now you say you cannot see you say in the galleries now and he says um, she tells um, Elia and now you say that you cannot see anything if you sit in the gallery you have to sit in the pit and then earlier we sat in the very same gallery and we saw everything well enough and she says sight has gone with our poverty so all again the same sentence I'm going to repeat simple pleasures of life have been lost once they acquired greater wealth and then she says there was pleasure in eating strawberries this is the next paragraph before they became quite common in the first dish of peas while they were yet dear to have them for a nice supper a treat what treat can we have now so she says earlier when we had less money even a dish of strawberries you get a few fresh strawberries you would consider it a treat you get a dish of peas green peas maybe when they were yet dear means when they were costly if you buy a 
uh, dish of peas that would make you so happy because that was a special treat it would make a nice supper but today what is the condition if we were to treat ourselves now that is to have dainties a little above our means it would be selfish and wicked it is the very little more that we allow ourselves beyond what so she says now if we buy something expensive it is actually wicked because we are already spending so much money on what we are eating so it would be really wicked and selfish to pay more money on it and she comes to the conclusion that we could um, enjoy treats and enjoy small luxuries only when we were poor now since we have a lot of money or adequate money nothing uh, even if you spend a little more money to get something that only makes you guilty it doesn't give you pleasure that's what she says in that paragraph uh, and so earlier here she also says this that um, it is a very little more that we allow ourselves beyond what the actual poor can get at actual poor means the poorest of the poor who cannot buy anything so she doesn't want to be that kind of poor but a, a middling poor uh, when two people living together as we have done now and then indulge themselves in a cheap luxury which both like with while each apologizes and is willing to take both halves of the blame to his single share so that was real fun she says uh, once in a while we used to both of us were living together and so uh, we um, we had to sometimes we would indulge in some cheap luxury we would want to buy something like the the folio mentioned earlier or a painting or any such thing and then uh, we would both apologize to each other for spending money and both w- uh, were willing to take the blame it is because of me that i we spend the money so there was so much of uh, understanding between the two of them i see no harm in people making much of themselves in that sense of the word so they cared for each other and they they also cared for themselves they were willing to spend and uh, derive pleasure out of small luxuries but now she says that doesn't happen so we should uh, so she says it was nice to be poor not the poorest poor but just a little above poverty and then again in the next paragraph she says i know what you were going to say that this that it is mighty pleasant at the end of the year to make all meet and much ado we used to have every 31st night of december to account for our exceedings many a long face did you make over your puzzled accounts and in contriving to make it out how we had spent so much or that we had not spent so much or that it was impossible we should spend so much next year and still we found a slender capital decreasing but then betwixt ways and projects and compromises of one sort or another and talk of curtailing this cha- this charge and doing without that for the future and the hope that youth brings in laughing spirits in which you were never poor till now we pocketed up our loss and in conclusion with lusty brimmers as you used to quote it out of a hearty cheerful mr cotton as you called him we used to welcome in the coming guest now we have no reckoning at all at the end of the old year no flattering promises about the new year doing better for us now in this paragraph i'll just sum it up quickly she says that um, earlier on the last day of every year 31st night of december uh, they used to sit down and uh, uh, take an account of uh, all their expenses of their exceedings exceedings means all these extras and then um, you that is elia would make a long face and he would wonder how did we spend so much how could we do that we should not have spent so much and next year we are not going to spend this much and they used to uh, talk about all these things and they used to make plans about how in the next year they will try to curtail this expense and uh, or maybe we will not do something for the next year means in the sense that maybe they wanted to buy a new table so they decide okay we are not going to buy it next year we'll buy it the year next so all kind of um, calculations they used to make uh, and finally they used to in spite of all this uh, troubles finally they used to very happily welcome the next year and um, elia used to always quote mr cotton here mr cotton is actually a reference to the poet charles cotton he was a minor poet of the 17th century and he has written a poem called the new year 
and that's a very small and a sweet poem where he talks about uh, the year ending and the new year and he talks about in the poem you have janus janus is uh, uh, the god who's uh, the two-headed god after whom january is named so he has one uh, head face this way and one that is one head facing forward the other facing backward and so backward means the past forward is what comes uh, what lies ahead and so in that poem uh, it is said uh, that um, uh, they talk about all the regrets he expresses all regrets for the past year but then towards the end of the poem he says that is okay because janus the face that is facing forward towards a new year has a pleasant countenance it seems to be happy that means happy things are going to happen this year so let us forget all the sorrows of the past and let us look forward to the happiness that is in store for us in the new year so here and so quoting this uh, they used to always welcome the new year here the coming guest coming guest refers to the new year and she says so uh, that is how each year though they were poor though they had troubles they were very eager for the next year and she says now we have no reckoning at all at the end of the old year now we don't have to do a reckoning reckoning is uh, taking an account of the money spent where did the money go why did we spend so much what are we what expense are we going to cut next year nothing of that sort because we don't have to and just like we don't have any regrets about the expenses of the past year same way there is no promise about the future no flattering promises about the new year doing better for us so life has become kind of monotonous uh, nothing excites them anymore uh, no expectations no hopes they are living a kind of a, a listless life so that is all uh, this we saw uh, these were all the words of bridget she expresses her um, her sadness in having lost that kind of a life a life where they had financial troubles but yet life was on the whole more enjoyable now the next paragraph elia says bridget is so sparing of a speech on most occasions that when she gets into a rhetorical vein i am careful how i interrupt it i could not help however smiling at the phantom of wealth which her dear imagination had conjured up out of a clear income of poor 100 pounds a year so uh, he just lets her speak she has been speaking for quite some time the majority of the essay it was bridget speaking so he says bridget is often is mostly sparing of speech she doesn't speak much but once she starts speaking i don't interrupt her because she doesn't like to be interrupted if she really starts speaking so a rhetorical vein means a talkative mode or a loquacious kind of a temper she starts talking talking and talking and i don't interrupt but then he says i couldn't help smiling because now the income that they have now is just a poor 100 pounds a year but she talks about us as if we are very rich that's why he says the image of uh, the dear image smiling at the phantom of wealth which her dear imagination so a reader would think that they have become millionaires the way bridget is talking but all the income that they have is an income of a poor 100 pounds a year which is of course much higher than the income they used to have earlier and so he smiles when he thinks of how she talks of them as being extremely rich and then he replies to this long um, list of complaints now he replies it is true we were happier when we were poorer but we were also younger my cousin i am afraid we must put up with the excess for if we were to shake the superflux into the sea we should not mend ourselves that we had much to struggle with as we grew up together we have reason to be most thankful it strengthened and knit our compact closer we could never have been what we have been to each other if we had always had the sufficiency we should not complain of so he says i agree with you we were happier when we were poorer but there is something that you are forgetting very conveniently we were younger those days now we are not and so we have to put up with the excess we can't kind of throw everything into the ocean and continue to remain poor because we have to take care of ourselves and he says 
it is a good thing that we were poor that we had much to struggle with as we grew up together we have reason to be thankful he says i am grateful that we were poor earlier because and and that we have had to face so many struggles together when we were young because it strengthened the bond between the two of us it knit our compact closer and we could never have been what we have been to each other if we always had the sufficiency so he says if we always had money like we have now at least this much of money if we had earlier i don't think we will have this kind of a closeness because uh, the difficulties they faced together have made their bond very very strong and so he says we should be grateful for the poverty for the deprivation that we had faced earlier the resisting power those natural dilations of the youthful spirit which circumstances cannot straighten with us are long since passed away so he says we are not young anymore we don't have the resisting power that is we don't have the um, the power to fight or to challenge that has gone because we are old now we are an aging a man and an aging woman we don't have it in us to challenge fate and to resist that is gone competence to age is supplementary youth a sorry supplement indeed but i fear the best that is to be had so that sentence competence to age is supplementary youth so he says we have lost our youth instead to supplement the lost youth we have something else what is that competence competence here means financial competence being wealthy so he says when a person gets old being wealthy or at least having enough money to look after himself is a supplement to youth it is a sorry supplement of course it cannot really make up for the pleasures of youth but even then this is what we need when we are old because now we cannot strain ourselves like we used to when we were younger we must ride where we formerly walked live better and lie softer and shall be wise to do so than we had means to do in those good old days you speak of so he says now we must ride you complain that earlier we used to walk miles and miles now we are only riding we are not walking at all so he says that is how it is when you are old you cannot walk like you walked earlier you have to take life a little more easy we must ride we must live better we must eat better we must uh, take more rest lie softer so uh, all that we have to do now and he says in spite of all that let me tell you i would do anything to get back those happy days of youth and not exactly poverty but those happy days that's why he says uh, so he tries to tell uh, his cousin it is true that we were happier but then you should understand that the circumstances have changed we have advanced in years we have become old now so this is how old age should be lived we cannot go on walking like we used to walk when we were younger we have to ride now there is no other option because our bodies need rest we need to take things easier and then he says yet could those days return so he says i would do anything if we could get those days back yet could those days return could you and i once more walk our 30 miles a day could banister and mrs bland again be young and you and i be young to see them <clears throat> could the good old one shilling gal one shilling gallery days return they are dreams my cousin now but could you and i at this moment instead of this quiet argument by our well carpeted fireside sitting on this luxurious sofa be once more struggling up those inconvenient staircases pushed about and squeezed and elbowed by the poorest rabble of the poor gallery scramblers could i once more hear those anxious shrieks of yours and the delicious thank god we are safe which always followed with the topmost stair conquered let in the first light of the whole cheerful theater down beneath us I know not the fathom line that ever touched a descent so deep as I would be willing to bury more wealth in than Croesus had or the great Jew are is supposed to have to purchase it so what he says there is that I would do anything to get back those days I really wish like you that we could walk 30 miles a day like earlier 
that uh, Bannister and Mrs. Bland, the two actors who were the idols of our youth, I wish they would be young again. I wish you and I would be young again. And I wish we could go back to those one chilling days. But they are all dreams, my dear cousin. They simply cannot come back. And then, now we are sitting here on this, in this lux on this luxurious sofa by the fireside, very comfortably settled. And we are complaining about all this. And we are talking about uh, struggling up, how we used to struggle up those inconvenient staircases in the theatre. And how you used to shriek when somebody pushed you or pulled you. Uh, some you would shriek and then when you get a seat you would say thank god we are safe and you would sit down so he says i would do anything to get all those happy times back i would put in more wealth than creases creases is a uh, c-r-o-e-s-u-s -E pronounced as creases is a sixth century bc king of this place called lydia lydia is turkey okay uh, so he was um, I think he's an equivalent of what in Indian mythology is Kubera, Kubera, the god of wealth, or the uh, somebody who was very rich. So Croesus is something akin to that, and uh, who had a lot of wealth. And then another rich man is mentioned, the great Jew R. R. R refers to Rothschild, Rothschild, uh, a very rich German Jewish family. And they are a business family. Even now, they are very very rich. So he says that I would be willing to give give up all the wealth if I had wealth like Croesus, if I had wealth like Rothschild, I would be willing to give everything up if only we could get back those holy times, those happy times. Okay. So he is telling his uh, cousin Bridget that he too cherishes the memories of those days and he would very well be ready to give all his money if he could get those days back but the truth remains that whatever he gives youth is not going to return and those past days are never going to come back so he tells her let us not fret about that that is gone we have reached another phase of life it cannot be reverted and we cannot walk back into the past. So let us be happy with what we have now. And so the last sentence he says, And now, do just look at that merry little Chinese waiter holding an umbrella big enough for a bed tester over the head of that pretty, insipid, half Madonna-ish chit of a lady in that very blue summer house. So he says, don't worry about all that. You just look at this. You remember how this conversation started? They were having tea one late afternoon and they uh, had a fresh a new set of china and he was pointing out the various figures. And so now the essay at the end, it goes back to the same point. And he says, stop worrying, stop fretting. Come back to the reality and look at these pictures. Look at this merry Chinese waiter holding an umbrella, big enough for a bed tester. A bed tester is, uh, I guess, a kind of a canopy in maybe old four poster beds, a kind of a canopy that you have over the cot might be um, the bed tester. So here what he says is that uh, there is a very tiny lady, a pretty insipid half Madonna is chit of a lady. So uh, a a waiter is holding a huge umbrella for a tiny lady in a very blue summer house. And some of you might wonder why the color blue, always it is blue designs, blue figures. That is because uh, in old China, in porcelain vessels, you always had only one color. It was always blue on the white porcelain. Maybe those days uh, they did not have the technology to use other colors. Now in crockery you know that you can see a variety of colors but those days that is not how it was. And so he says let us be happy with the present. Let us not complain about the future. Let us now spend our comfortable life enjoying little things like the pictures on this uh, teacup. And he 
brings the essay to a very complete and a clean finish and that is why a critic has uh, said that this is one of um, uh, Charles Lamb's essays that has the most perfect ending. He begins with old China and he ends with old China. Now let us uh, take a quick look at the theme of the essay. So what is Charles Lamb trying to convey through this essay? One thing I think he is trying to tell is that art lives forever. Okay, I like uh, even if it is a China cup, the figures there, they don't face any decay. They are going to be there forever in the same, with the same freshness. Whereas human life changes. So art versus life, that is there. Because Bridget forgets that life has changed. She has forgotten that years have passed and now they are not young anymore. So the contrast between art and ordinary immortal life that is also there. Another thing is that you have to be happy or content with what you have. There is no point lamenting of the past. When life changes, we have to change our attitudes according to it. I guess that is something else that um, Lamb seems to convey through this essay. And of course, though basically it is the idea of the essay, it's quite simple. His um, uh, prose style is not exactly what we can call easy style because you can see his sentences are very long and rambling. Uh, sentences extend almost to a full paragraph. He gives a lot of references and without understanding those references, you cannot get into the fabric of the essay. All that is there, but in spite of all these um, minor difficulties, we cannot help saying that the essay is thoroughly enjoyable. So that is what makes Charles Lamb popular even today. In spite of his digressions and uh, quotes and a lot of anecdotes in between, in spite of all that, I guess it is all that that makes his essays so intriguing and so interesting. So I really hope that I have helped you to understand the essay. Uh, I have not really spent much time on uh, the language. I have only tried to convey the meaning of the essay to you. As I always say, my attempt is just to introduce you to the essay. And it is your responsibility to go onward from here. So I really and sincerely hope that you have enjoyed this essay.